Good morning. It is good to see and to hear all of you today. Welcome to St. Paul's UCC Church. My name is Liesl Higgins and I will be leading uh, the service today. So I just want to say a big welcome to all of you. Hopefully you are cool enough. Okay, good. Nobody is freezing yet. That's good. Okay, wonderful. The other thing that I want to point your attention to is that there is a bit of a change in the way that we are doing our liturgy or the order of service today. Everything in the bulletin is correct, but normally we uh, take the offering up after the sermon. And instead, today what we're going to do is to pray first and then to take up the offering. So I just wanted to alert you for those of you that are traditionalists and know, hey, this is a little something different. Yes, I know that. And I just wanted to acknowledge that for all of you. So uh, why don't we take a moment right now to wave hello to your neighbors next to you and also to greet our friends online. We're glad that you're here with us. Wonderful. We are gathered today in this place, expectantly anticipating that we are interacting with God. And so let us prepare our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our spirits. Sing to God, sing to God's praises, tell of God's wonderful works. Seek the presence of the Lord always. Glory to God. Let our hearts seek and rejoice. We gather to remember and declare God's faithful covenant as we lift our hearts in prayer. All powerful God, your word is perfect, but we struggle to be obedient. Grow in us a desire to be nourished by your commands and encourage us with your promises. Redeem us from all oppression and lead us into your light. Amen. Okay, at this time, would any of the children that are here come up? How are you? It is good to see all of you. Okay, so here's the thing. I need your help. I've already talked to Cora. Can I get your help? Perfect. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Today, we're going to practice listening. Perfect. You heard exactly what I was saying. Wonderful. Now, what do we need to do if we're going to listen? What are some things that need to happen? You listen just a tiny bit, yeah. So, what do we need to do with these things right here? We, yeah, we need to listen. Turn them on. Turn them on, exactly. Now, what do we need to do with this thing right here? If we're going to listen. Ooh, but if we're going to listen, that means we got to zip it, right? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to practice. Now, the first time we're going to do something... Yeah. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Can I ask you for your help? Okay. I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, I want you all to say your names out loud at the same time. Can you do that? Everybody knows their name? Perfect. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Liesl. Perfect. Okay, great. Now, could you understand what everybody was saying? I'm I know. I know. It's wonderful. Okay, we're going to try this again. I'm going to count to three, and this time you're going to do the exact same thing. You're going to say your name out loud, but this time what I want you to do is I want you... Okay. You always stay quiet? 
Yeah? Okay. This time we're going to count to three. I'm going to count to three. You're going to say your names. Only I want you to see if you can hear what I'm saying while you're saying your name. Okay? You got it? One, two, three. Jesus loves you. Oh, you read lips, don't you? Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Very good. Okay, so this listening thing, minus lip reading, maybe not working out so great. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do it one last time. I'm going to count to three, only this time I need you to be very, very quiet. I don't need you to say anything, okay? So our mouths are going to be quiet, our ears are going to be on, because we're going to be listening, and I guarantee you we're going to hear something, okay? But we can't hear it if you're talking. So, what are we going to do when I count to three? We're going to be quiet, right? Okay, here we go. And we're going to listen. And we might hear more than one thing. So we have to be quiet so we're hearing more than one thing. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Did you hear that? Yeah, I heard it too. How come you were able to hear it? Because you were quiet. Very good. Now, is it easy to be quiet? Is it? You always are quiet. Okay, that's wonderful. You were quiet. Yes, you were. Great job. I do like your nails. It is hard to be quiet. They are. And this is why sometimes it's hard to be quiet because we have so many important things we want to stay, say, right? A little bit later in the service today, I'm going to tell a story about a man named Solomon who asked God to be a good listener. In fact, he asked God for a hearing heart. Can your heart hear? That seems kind of strange, doesn't it? But you know what we just did when we got really quiet and we were listening? That's what we were doing. We were having a hearing heart. So later, you should be listening to this story about Solomon because you just helped what all of them are going to do a little bit later. Uh, I was doing it. You were doing it. Yes, that's right. Okay. All right. Will you pray with me? Okay. God, thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you for thinking that our words and our emotions are important. Help us to have a hearing heart. Help us to listen really well, not just for you, God, but to all the people in our lives that are helpers, our parents, our family, our teachers, our friends. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for your help. Good morning. morning. We have um, our first reading this morning. So God has so many lessons he'd like to teach us if we just listen a little bit. Thanks, Liesl. This morning's first scripture reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 37, verses 1 through 9 and 23 and 24. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, 
it only leads to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, and those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Our steps are made firm by the Lord when he delights in our way. Though we stumble, we shall not fall headlong, for the Lord holds us by the hand. Here ends God's reading. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Tom. We continue to hear God's word from 1 Kings 3, and I am actually going to start with verse 3 to 15. Hear the word of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern these, this great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you, if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Then Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. He came to Jerusalem where he stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. He offered up burnt offerings and offerings of well-being and provided a feast for all his servants. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I've been thinking about wishes this week, specifically magic wishes, um, which brought to mind Disney's movie, Aladdin. For those of you that don't know that movie, Aladdin runs, rubs a lamp and unleashes a very boisterous and hilarious genie that is voiced by the very late um, and great Robin Williams. The genie tells Aladdin that he is now the master of the genie and as a result, the genie must grant three wishes to Aladdin. Aladdin can make any wish he wants except for two things. One, Aladdin cannot wish to make someone fall in love with him. And two, Aladdin cannot wish for more wishes. Other than that, Aladdin has freedom to use his, his wishes however he wants. Throughout the movie, Aladdin does use two of his three wishes to save himself from either danger or death. But in a heroic sacrifice, when Aladdin could have used the very last wish to become a mighty ruler, he instead uses that last wish to grant freedom to the genie, which has me wondering about wishes. What would I wish for? What would you wish for? Now to be clear, today's scripture is not about genies or magic, but the heart of the scripture is just that. What is at the heart of a person 
who has been given an unrestricted wish. We're examining the heart of King Solomon today. Solomon was the son of King David and Bathsheba. However, Solomon was not the firstborn son. The crown could have been granted to any number of his older half-brothers, but King David named Solomon as his successor and established him as the king before he died. The scripture takes place in Gibeon, which is about four miles northwest of Jerusalem, and it was also the site of a very large shrine. It was also the place of the tabernacle. And for those of you that remember your Old Testament history, the tabernacle was the portable sanctuary that the Israelites carried with them after they left Egypt and were wandering around in the desert. At this time in history, there is no temple in Jerusalem. God's people worshiped in high places like the shrine. And there was this very long and complicated history about that worship at the high places. But this form of, of ritual and worship was acceptable as long as it was directed to God and not to a foreign God. Now, in last week's message in scripture, we heard about Jacob's certain dream at a certain place. And that place appeared pretty ordinary. Well, today's scripture takes place at another certain place. Only this place is uh, special because it's the principal high place. Gibeon was holy not just because that's where the, the shrine was and the tabernacle was, but it's also holy because that's where God appeared to Solomon. In this ancient society, people who were seeking divine counsel were known to sleep at a shrine or a sanctuary in order to have a holy dream. So Solomon's motivation for being at Gibeon is not very clear for us. In 1 Kings 3, it begins by acknowledging that Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statues of his father David, but, but he also sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. Loving the Lord and following in the footsteps of his father did not necessarily mean that Solomon was always doing the right thing. At Gibeon, Solomon made an incredible offering of a thousand burnt sacrifices. Now this is impressive, and it far exceeded what was expected based on the sacrificial laws in the book of Leviticus. It's possible that Solomon was trying to atone for mistakes he's already made, just prior to this, the scripture notes that he has married an Egyptian princess, and possibly he's feeling guilty about the way that he has dealt with coming to the throne. He had several of his enemies killed. But as the newly crowned king, Solomon's offerings could also be understood as honoring, celebrating, and making public his dedication to the covenantal relationship between God and the king. Whatever Solomon's motivations or hopes, God appeared. In the dream, God addressed Solomon, what do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. Now all of this seems pretty fantastic to me. I mean, as the newly crowned king, you've got enough wealth to sacrifice a thousand animals and now the God of the universe shows up and gives you basically an unrestricted wish. Hmm, <clears throat> Feels kind of magical a little bit. But the magic rests not in the fact that God made the request or the offer, but it's in Solomon's response. There are three parts to Solomon's response. Solomon begins by praising God as the reason why the throne has remained in his family. Solomon tells God, you have shown great and steadfast love to my father David because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and uprightness of heart toward you. Now this sounds like a eulogy to me a little bit, kind of like the kind words that a son would say about a father. And I don't wanna be dismissive of Solomon's sentiment or even the validity of what he's saying. David was an amazing king. And also, it's important to remember the less sanitized version of who David was. David was impulsive, ready to shed blood when he was provoked. While David was a fugitive from King Saul, he spent time as a mercenary fighting against Israel. David had multiple wives, committed adultery, sexually assaulted Bathsheba. David was an ineffective and neglectful father. 
failing to discipline his children or address major issues within his family. All of this chaos resulted in an attempted coup by one of his sons, as well as the death of several of his children. David's character and lack of character impacted not just his family, but his kingdom as well. And all of this may have been on Solomon's mind and heart when Solomon addressed God. I can almost hear an unspoken but. But you, God, have kept for my father, King David, this great and steadfast love and have given him a son, me, Solomon, to sit on this throne today. Despite all of his failings, God loved David and preserved the legacy of his family to retain the throne of Israel. Solomon was likely aware of how thin the thread was between him and his father's throne. The second portion of Solomon's response is awareness that it was God who placed Solomon on the throne. Solomon says, O oh Lord my God, you have made me king in place of my father David. Now, God did allow Solomon to su succeed his father as king, but the events of 1 Kings chapter 2 also detail how Solomon took his own measures to secure the throne, some of which I said involved bloodshed. So Solomon already has his own complicated and ugly history. He is every bit as human and therefore fallible as his father, David. Solomon was not a political pawn, but neither is he ignorant about his own personal limitations. Solomon recognized that it is ultimately God who crowns kings. We know this because Solomon admits his weakness. I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Certainly, Solomon had big shoes to fill. His father was a famous warrior king, and in many ways, probably a difficult act to follow. The phrase to go out or come in is actually a military reference. Solomon really wants to lead well in battle, just like his father did. But while he may have been unprepared for all of this, scholars note that Solomon was not a child. He already had children of his own at the time that he became king. So this second portion of his address to God presents Solomon as humbled, or at least awed, by the enormous responsibility of leadership for a great and numerous people. All of which leads to the third portion of his address, the real heart of the matter. Solomon asked God to give him an understanding mind to govern the people with the ability to discern between good and evil. Now, this might seem like a straightforward sentence, but there's a lot of nuance here. And once again, our English words don't really do justice to what the Hebrew has for us. The Hebrew word for understanding is shama, and it means to hear. In this ancient setting, it was the heart and not the mind that was the means of knowing. What Solomon is asking for is a hearing heart so that he may be able to be able to discern between good and evil a hearing heart i think that's a lovely image scripture tells us that solomon's request pleased the lord as a result god tells solomon because you have asked for this and have not asked for a long life or for riches or for the life of your enemies but have asked for a hearing heart to discern what is right I will do as you have asked. Indeed, I will give you a wise and listening heart. But that's not all that God will give to Solomon. God also promises to bestow riches, fame, and long life on Solomon. But there is a caveat. Solomon must walk in the ways of God, keeping God's statutes and commandments. God is making a connection between Solomon's request and God's response. A hearing heart will require not just blind obedience to God, but the cultivation of an ongoing relationship. God is telling Solomon that a hearing heart can function no other way. This scripture concludes with Solomon returning to Jerusalem, standing before the Ark of the Covenant and offering sacrifices. 
The change in location from Gibeon to Jerusalem for these offerings signifies that King Solomon is taking to heart God's counsel to walk in God's ways. King Solomon is cultivating a hearing heart and acting accordingly. Today's scripture continues to emphasize God's amazing grace. Last week we heard about Jacob, the master of manipulation and deception. Jacob was a fugitive with what appeared to be a very uncertain future, and yet God promised him blessings and God's ongoing presence. Today we are reminded of the very flawed King David, bloodthirsty, impulsive, unfaithful, and ineffective, the security of his life and throne in danger in his final years. Yet God allowed David to retain the throne and name his own successor. And Solomon, a new king concerned with gaining military wisdom, but who ultimately asked for a hearing heart so he could rule well. While each of these men could have been disqualified or ignored by God, they were not. In each instance, God received and blessed them, not because of their goodness, but because of God's great love for them in spite of their failings. Today's scripture led me from wondering about magic wishes to the practice of listening, specifically Solomon's request for a hearing heart. What does it look like to have a hearing heart? How is a hearing heart cultivated? I think it begins and ends in prayer. God desires to hear from us in prayer. God wants our real words, our real words, those that we speak out loud and those that we utter in the silence of our hearts. And God is not afraid of our emotions. There is no hiding from God. So there is no need to clean up or pretend about our anger, our frustration, our confusion, our doubts, or our tears. Nor is there a need to present our prayer in a certain way or to sound like anyone else but ourselves when we pray. Offering ourselves honestly in prayer is both honoring and essential. However, I need to admit something. My prayer life is frequently sporadic and self-centered. I frequently barrage God with the list of things I want done, and my family can tell you I'm really good at rattling off a list of things I want done. That list includes uh, people I want healed, protection for my loved ones, certainly help with all of my seminary classwork. And I'm a verbal processor, as my husband and my good friends know. So I frequently don't know what I am thinking or feeling until it's coming out of my mouth. But here's the thing. If I'm doing all of the talking in my relationship with God, I'm never getting the opportunity to hear from God. And when I'm busy talking, I'm missing out on that opportunity to cultivate a hearing heart. I believe that a hearing heart is the ultimate gift that God wants to grow in our prayer life. God welcomes our real words and our honest emotions. And then we are invited to be brave and patient to listen and to receive from God. So how do we begin to have a hearing heart? Just like anything else, we practice. And we're going to practice right now. Similar to what the children just experienced. So I'm really grateful that they were here to help us with this. Here's what this is going to look like. You're going to be invited to become still and quiet right where you are. You can keep your eyes open or you can close them. Don't worry if you need to cough or shuffle in your seat or someone small near you is making noise, it's completely fine. The invitation is to be still enough to notice the quiet or the near quiet that's in and around you. You will be encouraged to take a few deep breaths 
to help settle yourself and to clear your thoughts. We will invite God to be with us in the silence and to speak to our hearts. And we're going to sit in 90 seconds. I promise you it's 90 seconds because I've got my phone up here, okay? If you've ever sat still and quiet, 90 seconds might feel like 90 years, but I assure you it is 90 seconds. We're going to sit in silence and listen. Now, when, when, not if, your mind wanders, know that you are not doing it wrong. We live in a fast-paced world, and probably few of us are practiced in the art of sitting, sitting still and quietly. So when you get distracted, you can just acknowledge it, take another breath, and return your attention to God. The invitation is just to be still. However, I do need to say this. Sometimes what seems like a distraction is really God focusing your attention. I once led a group of women through this exercise, and one of the women was very pregnant at the time. And she told me later that she felt like she had done the exercise wrong because as she was sitting there in the quiet, trying to focus on God, all she could focus on was this baby that was being very active inside of her. And she said, I feel like I failed because I missed it. I don't think she missed it. I think that was God drawing her attention to the gift that he had for her. So, if there is a distraction that comes your way, whether you're pregnant or not, go with it, because it may be the gift that God has for you in this moment. God is eager and willing to engage with all of us. So even if this feels new and uncertain and scary, know that God never speaks in guilt or shame. God never bullies you. God always wants to draw closer to us as we draw closer to God. God does not want us to hide from ourselves or from God. So dare, dare to trust and hope that God has good things to speak and to share at your attempt with a hearing heart. The exercise is going to be over when you hear the music, and we're not going to sing right away. Instead, I've asked for the music to play for a little bit just to give us a chance to take note of what we just experienced. So you may want to write down a note or two. Anything that is interesting or remarkable or even that you have a question about, that might be worth noting. What did you see, hear, feel, taste, touch in this, in this experience? Those might be the things you would want to write down. I will close our time together with prayer leading us into the Lord's Prayer, and then following our time of prayer, we will then sing. Okay? Friends, the truth is that when we pray, something always happens. So let us approach this exercise with willingness to trust and to hope. Will you join me in prayer? Loving God, we are drawing closer to you. We have lots of thoughts and feelings about this. Open us to you with hopeful expectancy. Help us to quiet our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. Thank you for the very breath in our lungs. Awaken our senses to your presence. <clears throat> Prepare us now to receive you in stillness and silence.
good and gracious God, we thank you that you are mighty and majestic and holy, and also that you are personal, that you desire relationship with us. Lord, we confess that we fall short of the mark, that frequently we are busy talking or demanding in our time with you. We can even be casual and dismissive about spending time with you. And yet time and time again, as proven in scripture, you prove over and over that your great love is for us and is with us. Thank you for loving us well enough past our own failings. We also offer up the things that we do carry with us, the things that are maybe quick on our lips or the things that we carry deep in our hearts that no one else knows. We admit sometimes we think we're even hiding it from you. Lord, thank you for entering into all of the things that concern us. Thank you for this time that we spent with you, drawing close to you. I pray, Lord, that what was experienced here is not the end, but the beginning of more opportunities to sit in stillness, to quiet ourselves and to draw close to you, that we would develop a hearing heart. By the power of Jesus Christ, I seal in what this experience was, all of the goodness that you offer. And I stand against anything from the enemy that would cause us to feel shamed or bullied or not worthy. Thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we are aware of the things that we carry in our hearts, and we are especially aware that families within our community have lost dear loved ones and or getting ready to say goodbye to loved ones. And so we lift up those families to you, trusting that they are in your care, that you will be comforting them and providing them hope and peace as they grieve. Lord, there's much more to say but it seems fitting to end with the words that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you leave this place, may you go ready to continue to cultivate a hearing heart. May you go confident that as you draw closer to God, God also draws closer to you. And that as you draw closer, may you know that you know that you know that you are dearly loved. Amen.